Hello everyone, my name is David. I'm a research scientist at Uber ATG, and in the next couple of minutes, we'll be talking about sensor platforms for self-driving vehicles and going into details about the inner workings of each sensor and their pros and cons. So let's first consider which aspects are desirable in a platform. Robustness is paramount here. This is hardware that will be out on the road, vibrating, exposed to all sorts of weather, and being responsible for a one-ton vehicle, potentially at high speeds. So safety is critical. Naturally, we want sensors that are individually resilient, but also a platform that has redundancies in case of failures and capability in all weathers, day or night. We also want our sensors to provide rich information about the environment and our actions upon it. The geometry of the scene, the appearance, the road configuration, and a way to determine very precisely our position in it and how the vehicle is behaving. Let's start there and consider the sensors for proprioception. All right, thanks, Davi. My name is Andre, and I work at ATG Toronto in R&D, uh, in localization. And today I'm gonna to be talking about GNSS and the proprioceptive sensors used for localization. And afterwards, Davi will return to talk about perception sensors, radar, LIDAR, cameras, and so on. So the sensors which perceive the vehicle's internal state are called proprioceptive. And these sensors have been common in non-autonomous driving for many decades, and they include things such as wheel encoders and accelerometers and so on. And these sensors are also used in autonomous driving. So here, wheel encoders, for example, are used together with an inertial measurement system, as well as the GNSS, or Global Navigation Satellite System, to produce course estimate of the vehicle pose. So let's now take a closer look at each of these sensors. So the GNSS, or Global navigation satellite system, of which the United States GPS is by far the most famous implementation, are beacon-based global localization providers, which leverage time delay measurements to multiple satellites in order to infer a receiver's location. And with no costs apart from the receiver itself, consumer-grade GNSS is highly inexpensive. And at the same time, with uh, most receivers being able to connect to America's GPS, Europe's Galileo, Russia's GLONASS, and so on, this type of localization is readily available pretty much anywhere on Earth. However, GNSS is, of course, not without its downsides and limitations. So, you know, using GNSS systems alone does not provide the centimeter level accuracy necessary to leverage HD maps for safe autonomous driving. And while real-time kinematic, or RTK for short systems, which leverage differential GPS uh, together with IMUs, are able to achieve this centimeter level precision, they are substantially more expensive and more complex than the base system, while also depending on the, avail the availability of the base stations to begin with. And additionally, the satellite readings themselves can also be inaccurate in places such as urban canyons due to tall buildings, or they can be even completely unavailable in places such as tunnels and underground parking lots. As such, autonomous vehicles cannot rely solely on RTK systems for high availability localization, and instead must use complementary methods such as map-based LiDAR localization. All right, so an IMU is another type of sensor, another completely different family, which tracks the vehicle's linear acceleration and its angular rate. IMUs typically consist of two major components, an accelerometer and a gyroscope. Accelerometers are typically implemented as spring mass damper systems in the form of a microelectromechanical system or MEMS. And this makes them very inexpensive and compact. And on the gyroscope side, typically in autonomous driving, people use uh, optical gyros though there are many, many different ways of implementing gyros. While the physics behind these sensors are extremely interesting, in the interest of time, we will skip them. And folks who are interested in learning more about the inner workings of such sensors should check out the references at the bottom of our slides, which will be shared after, uh, after the tutorial. Uh, and specifically, Roland Siegward's textbook on autonomous robot robots is a great place to start learning more about these sensors. And while tactical grade IMUs can have drift of less than a degree per hour, Consumer grade automotive grade IMUs uh, are substantially more prone to drift. And they are therefore used as complementary sensors to other modalities, such as cameras for visual inertial odometry. They're used together with GPS to form RTK systems and so on. Next, we have wheel encoders, which are a type of tachometer and perhaps one of the very first sensors to be attached to a car together with stuff like fuel and battery and oil pressure sensors. And conceptually, wheel encoders are very, very simple. They just count the revolutions of a wheel, which allows one to approximate a wheel's total travel distance. 
There are countless ways to implement such sensors, including brush, optical, magnetic, inductive, capacitive, you name it. Um, and in this slide in particular, we're looking at an optical encoder, which has a very simple but effective design. It consists simply of a disc with holes in it and a tiny LED which shines a light towards this disc. And as it spins, it causes the light pattern to pulse and get interrupted proportional to the rotational speed of the wheel. And this pattern can be perceived by a very simple optical sensors on the other side, which can just count the number of ticks and thus the total revolution count of the wheel. And of course, you can just use like a pair of these LEDs to make sure that you are um, keeping track of the direction in which the wheel is spinning. And once you have this, you can basically just compute the, the total travel distance given the wheel radius. And just like IMUs, wheel encoders are used jointly for localization together with other sensors such as GPS and LiDAR. And with this, I will let Davi take over once more and talk about sensors that are used in perception. Thanks, Andre. For perception, we want sensors that capture the state of the world. LiDARs are one of the most common sensors in the self-driving platforms due to the very accurate geometry their point clouds provide. Radars are very similar to LiDARs in their inner workings and provide a nicely complementary sensing modality. Ultrasounds are yet another provider of range. They are very effective at very close distances. And naturally, we have cameras, which are probably the most natural sensor to us humans. And lastly, we have microphones. LiDARs are our trusted scanners. They work by shooting a laser beam, typically a low power infrared, down a very well controlled angle and measuring how much time it takes for the laser to return, which defines a 3D point. They employ anywhere from a single laser along the zenith axis to a few hundred. In self-driving applications, the 64 version is the most common, which typically provides around 80,000 points for a full sweep. The strength of the sensor is that it produces very accurate and directly actionable geometry. They do not depend on ambient lighting since it uses its own lasers, does work the same during the day or night. And by measuring the change in strength between the emitted and returned photons, it produces a measure of reflectance, which is informative of the color and material of the object, subject to the incidence angle of the laser, of course. But this is typically good enough to find lane markings, for instance. Its cons is that first, it's an expensive sensor. Its price has been decreasing over the past few years with new efficiencies in the technology, but it still costs tens of thousands of dollars. The resolution is still limited when we compare its 64 lasers to, for instance, the 1080 pixels of an HD camera. By the way, let's clarify something. Sometimes LiDAR is referred to as a sparse sensor, but that is imprecise. LiDAR produces dense readings in the perspective of the capture, which is the range image. The sparsity is introduced by the reprojection onto bird's eye view that is typically done. But the same would happen if we were to back project a camera image, for instance. The LiDAR is sensitive to weather, though and will typically produce spurious readings when there is no rain or fog. An interesting phenomenon happens when there are water puddles, as in some circumstances, they might act as a mirror and produce spurious points. These are generally easy to handle by knowing the ground height, though. Solid state lighters are a cutting edge design that aims to remove the moving parts from lighter scanners. Forms of the sensor are becoming increasingly popular with consumer electronics, being common these days in smartphones and gaming accessories, to name a few examples. There is still a broad range of approaches to this design. We will go over three types, but that is by no means an exhaustive list. First, we have gated cameras, which work by emitting an infrared wave at a specific frequency and then making a sequence of gated captures, each corresponding to a controlled round trip travel time of the laser, which then defines the range. The issue here is that we have discrete range bands as opposed to a continuous value. Another design is closer to the LiDAR scanner, but uses a microelectromechanical system, or MEMS for short, to control a mirror that directs the laser beam onto the desired angles. This is technically a quasi-solid state system in the sense that there is still mechanical actuation, but the lasers and optics are static. The downside here is that the tiny mirror limits how much energy can be used in the laser beam and thus has reduced range. Alternatively, we can employ a wide laser beam that simultaneously reflects the entire scene, and then an array of photo detectors to capture the reflections, which is similar to a traditional camera, but measuring range instead of color. The two major challenges here are achieving long range returns, which will require a very strong beam, and increasing the number of cells in photo detectors, 
We have made great strides in regards to the resolution of cameras, but those are based on silicon, which is generally not sensitive to the laser frequencies used here. These sensors are based on gallium, which is more expensive and we have less manufacturing expertise with. Overall, solid state designs are more robust since they'll be less affected by the mechanical vibrations of a moving vehicle. And having instantaneous capture of the scene is also beneficial as it avoids the rolling shutter issue. We have touched on the con side of each design, but just to reiterate, the sensors still struggle to achieve long period ranges. The number of photo detector cells in wide beam lighters is still limited, thus providing lower resolution. And lastly, to achieve full scene coverage with these sensors, multiple units are required, which might offset the cost benefits. Radar is very similar to LiDAR, but instead of lasers, uses radio waves. It works by using an antenna to emit a low frequency wave and capture its reflections. By using the angle and the time delta of the return, a 3D position can be established. Most of you will be very familiar with this, when as a child, you would shout at a cliff and hear echoes from a variety of places. We have an extra benefit here by observing the changing frequency between the emitted and received wave. This informs us of the radial velocity of the target according to the Doppler effect. We're also able to manipulate the wave for more spread or range, which gives us operation modes for near or long range. Note that nothing prevents LiDAR from working with near range targets, but because it is typically positioned at the top of the roof, the vehicle itself occludes the near region, essentially casting a shadow. By, losing, by using lower frequency waves, radar is able to penetrate through rain, snow, and fog, making it more robust to weather. But this can also be problematic, as radar will also be able to penetrate through obstacles if they're small enough. They will also generally produce fewer points in comparison to LiDAR, but this varies considerably from model to model. Lastly, because of how waves propagate in space, the same object might create ghost detections due to multi-path returns. This happens when there are multiple reflections of the original signal before reaching the antenna. This is analogous to the Podil example of LiDAR. Ultrasounds are a much cheaper and simpler version of the previous sensors. In this case, the emitter sends an ultrasound wave with a specific frequency, and a microphone waits for reflections with a matching wave. The delay defines the minimum distance to the nearest obstacle. This establishes a semi-sphere of empty space as opposed to a point in LADAR or radar. The benefits of this sensor is that it's very cheap and already available in most consumer vehicles. It's also very effective at near range where just knowing that there is something close to the vehicle, regardless of its very precise position, is already actionable information. On the other hand, just knowing the sphere of empty space doesn't really give you much geometry about the environment. A little note here is that by using a network of ultrasound sensors, we can actually triangulate the position of returns when a chirp from one emitter is heard in a neighboring receiver. This is called the cross echo. But in either case, you would only measure the nearest obstacle. So it gives you a very coarse understanding of the scene and is not enough to identify individual instances of objects if there are multiple ones. Lastly, it's also a sensor that tends to be noisy, given all the background sound around the vehicle, especially at higher speeds. Cameras are probably the most popular sensor here. We all have them in our phones and can immediately relate to the sensing modality with our eyes. They are based on a matrix of photosensitive cells that are filtered for a specific color band, typically red, green, and blue, at a ratio of two green cells for each red and blue cell. This proportion is designed to mimic human perception. This raw information is converted to RGB pixels using a process called debayering, which interpolates the RGB value of each pixel from the raw sensor readings of each color. The benefits of this sensor is that by directly perceiving colors, we can infer the texture and materials of the scene, which is very informative for detecting objects. They are also generally cheap, provide high resolution data, and are vastly available which also means there is a rich body of literature on how to effectively use their data. They provide high frame rates, anywhere from 30 to 120 FPS, and each frame is an instant snapshot of the scene, as opposed to a gradual scan, as is the case for the spinning lighters. We can also use lenses to see very wide with fish eyes or very far with telescopes. Leveraging a mix of these is key for visual coverage. On the con side, an image is just a plane, so there is no explicit depth information. With a well-calibrated system, we can actually infer 
the angles of the rays, but you get 3D points, we would need a stereo setup, which is more challenging. Also, because cameras are, in essence, ambient light sensors, they entirely rely on external illumination and are thus less effective at night or in the dark. Furthermore, the interaction of the light with the lenses may also create artifacts such as distortion, which is especially pronounced in fish eyes, vignette, the darkening of the borders, flare, when light scatters in the lens, etc. To tackle the issue of lighting, some camera sensors are designed to operate using the infrared spectrum instead. This can be done either actively by illuminating the scene with infrared light, which essentially amounts to an obtrusive flash, or passively by using the natural emission of infrared due to the heat of bodies. These are sometimes referred to as thermal cameras and are generally the more relevant ones for self-driving. As such, these cameras have little reliance on ambient light and work just as well in the dark. The capture of passive infrared camera shows the heat of bodies and so is very useful in detecting living actors such as pedestrians or animals. On the limitation side, active infrared cameras have limited range as they need to provide the lighting themselves and naturally there's a limit to how much energy can be provided. Conversely, passive infrared is expensive because it requires special materials to make sensors that are very sensitive to infrared while not being subject to the black body radiation of the sensor itself, for instance, by warming up from this. Microphones are the oldest sensor here, but a very useful one. In essence, they work by converting the air vibrations from sound into electric signals. There are two main types of microphones, inductive, in which the air vibrations are captured by a diaphragm and then moves a coil around the magnet, inducing an electric current in the process, and there are capacitive microphones in which the diaphragm moves a charge capacitor plate, thus the discharging current when pushed closer to the opposite plate. In either case, both the amplitude and the frequency of the sound are extracted, which allows us to discern its nature and how loud it is. If we have an array of microphones, we can also find the direction of the sound source through a process called beamforming. This is analogous to stereo in vision and works by finding correspondences in the signal across microphones and the time deltas in each one, which allows us to triangulate the source of the sound since we know the speed at which it travels and the distances between the individual microphones. Microphones are an interesting sensor modality as it gives us an early alert to sirens or honking, for instance, even before the vehicle is visible from other sensors. There's also an interesting research direction in using background noise signatures as a way to bootstrap localization. And lastly, microphones are very cheap. On the con side, much like ultrasounds, microphones will be affected by the noise from the eco vehicle itself, the wind, the height speeds, etc. Furthermore, even though we can extract some geometry with beam forming, it's still very coarse and prone to acoustic artifacts. In this video, we show a few of the sensor modalities we discussed before. The fine points are the LIDAR returns colored for reflectance. The bold points are radar returns with an indication for the measured radio velocity. The red arcs are the ultrasound echoes and the blue arcs are the cross echoes. We can see as pedestrians approach the vehicle, fewer LiDAR points are produced, but the radar appropriately detects their presence and velocity, paired with stronger ultrasound signals. We also have reliable measurements to the vehicle in front and behind of us.